Hello and welcome to the EduTalk series hosted by Biotone, Biotone EduPartner Program and Massage Industry Experts. With the challenges continuing to face massage schools, students and practicing therapists, thanks to COVID and its variants, the EduTalk series by Biotone continues to support virtual learning and building massage community by connecting you with industry experts who share their knowledge and expertise on topics not only for class discussion, but career success. Tonight's expert is Kathleen Leeson, a board certified massage therapist and lymphedema therapist. Her work focuses on helping clients after liposuction, Brazilian butt lifts, tummy tucks, facelifts, and other surgical procedures. As an educator, she's taught at IPSB Massage College and is an approved NCB TMB continuing education provider. Additionally, Kathleen has presented at the American Venus and Lymphatic Society and at National Lymphedena Network Conferences. She's also the author of Plastic Surgery Recovery Handbook. And if you want to learn more about that book, visit biotone.com and check under the EduTalks tab for the author series. And Kathleen reviews her book there. Let's listen and learn today with Kathleen as she discusses postoperative massage following plastic surgery. She'll introduce a variety of techniques that can benefit clients after plastic surgery procedures. She'll discuss the research behind manual lymphatic drainage and other modalities used for reducing tightness, swelling, and fibrosis after surgery. Before I turn it over to Kathleen, again, please be sure you have your video off and your sound is muted. Thank you again for joining us. And Kathleen, welcome. I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I would love to thank Biotone, first of all, for giving us this opportunity um, to share um, our expertise. I love it because um, if you look at the Biotone website, you'll see um, in past months and years, there's a wealth of other um, expert massage therapists that have shared about the modalities that they practice. So thank you very much for giving us all this opportunity. So today uh, we're gonna talk about post-operative massage following plastic surgery. Um, who am I? Um, I am a, uh, I've trained with CLOSE as a lymphedema therapist. I'm a Nick Timba approved provider. Um, and um, I'll share more about the classes later. I'm also a board certified massage therapist through Nick Timba. And as she said, I'm the author of the Plastic Surgery Recovery Handbook. So the first uh, topic I want to talk about is um, because I want to schedule. I want to. I wanted to put some stuff together that even though you may have already taken my classes um, and heard uh, my other webinars, I wanted this to be kind of fresh information that I still think is really important for us to know. And I want to bust a few um, misconceptions in the industry as well. So the first thing I want to talk about something that's really important as we see um, the demand for this really outpacing the resources of massage therapists who are trained to do this work after plastic surgery is the question, do the clients want trained therapists for this work? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, I asked this in a group and one of the answers was, a uh, person emailed us back and said, I recently had an abdominoplasty and yes, I would like for my therapist to be honest with me. I want to receive my optimal results and lymphatic massages play an important part. So I would really um, stress strongly that this industry is not something you can just put your hands on a client after surgery um, unless you have this specialized training. 
So um, let's talk about some advice from fellow massage therapists. Um, and I talked to fellow massage therapists about what level of training did you have before you were comfortable to help people? Um, and these were their answers. We need to refer out when we don't know. It's just not fair to clients and they will have a negative experience with us if we don't have the level of training that we need to help them. And that is a risk for our business. I had that myself um, as a beginning massage therapist when I just had MLD skills and I did not yet have fibrosis massage skills and I was seeing my first cases of fibrosis after liposuction. I just didn't know what to do to help the clients. And it was a risk for my business because these clients who had fibrosis did not get the treatment that they wanted, that they needed, and they never rebooked. So luckily I learned through every resource I could to figure out what I could do to help reduce fibrosis. And now I get clients rebooking and rebooking. And again, Michelle, who's the second quote tells us the MLD certification is just the starting point. You need more knowledge of individual surgical procedures before you put your hands on post-op recovery patients. So as a therapist, I base my treatments on two things. One, the client's pain tolerance, how much, uh, you know, how, and I interact with them. I talk with them all the time about how much pain they're feeling. I'm not going to put clients in a pain level over four on a pain scale of one to 10. Um, I need to do, I need to change something in the way I deliver massage so that it's less painful for them. And uh, my other criteria is the client stage of wound healing. And we'll learn more about that in a second. But first I wanna talk about um, one of the big misconceptions. Um, and that is people who have taken a small amount of MLD training will be very confident that MLD should never hurt. MLD should never hurt. And in fact, MLD does hurt. It can be um, uncomfortable and painful if it's given right after plastic surgery. So I recently had a bunch of facial plastic surgery. This is a picture of me one week post-op. And absolutely, when I was doing MLD to myself, and I went to a really highly trained MLD provider in San Diego, and what she was doing to me was not the same feeling as getting MLD without plastic surgery. But the good news is, that though it may be painful at first, the pain level should reduce as we continue giving it in the massage. And this is a great study um, from 2019. Research shows that manual lymphatic drainage increases their pain threshold. So they're able to um, withstand more pain um, and it reduces their pain, it increases their pain tolerance. So they're able to tolerate more pain. Um, at the end of the massage at the beginning, because I've seen that um, even this morning in when I was giving a massage to someone after Brazilian butt lift, they were very tender at the beginning of the massage. And by the end of the massage, they enjoyed it. It felt less tender as I was continuing to give the manual lymphatic drainage fodder style. So let's look at some of the stages of wound healing. So the first stage is one where uh, the licensed, properly trained massage therapist is not going to see a client at this point. This is hemostasis. It's from the time th that there is a cut to the skin to the blood clotting. Um, the body is going to form a platelet plug, and it's the the it's going to basically um, heal itself off so the body doesn't bleed out. That's the hemostasis stage of wound healing. I start seeing people in the inflammatory stage. I start people four days, five days after their liposuction. This, uh, the inflammation starts along hemostasis, but it lasts longer. Once you have the platelet plug, you're still in the inflammatory stage. Basically, this is the stage of localized swelling um, and the body is using the swelling to help heal itself. It's using the swelling to help deliver um, the nutrients and the parts of the body that help the body heal itself. And it's removing damaged cells and bacteria. It's very important to know that inflammation is a natural part of the body's healing process. And we should not just try to stop it or try to reduce the swelling as soon as possible, like within hours or days. We have to let the body naturally heal itself after surgery. Um, 
I get this question a lot like, oh, uh, you know, what can I do to reduce the swelling? What can I do to reduce the swelling? And at some point, I, I want to work alongside with what the body's doing and support it. But we can't just um, stop inflammation altogether because that's the body's way of healing itself. Um, so you can't just, someone asked me like three weeks ago when I said, um, what I usually do, my recipe for estimating how many sessions someone is gonna get is two hours of lymphatic massage per liter of liposuction taken out. So they were going to have like three and a half liters taken out. And they said, well, can I just like sit on the table for seven hours while you do the massage to me? No, you can't just get it all out of the way at once. Um, it, healing is a process and you have to go through that process. Then, um, so anyways, with, it, with the inflammatory, that's the type of massage that we're gonna do is MLD, manual lymphatic drainage, to help support the body in the healing process. Once we get to proliferative and maturation, that's when we can start getting creative because this is when we will start to see fibrosis um, happen. The swelling can still be there in the proliferative um, stage, but we might start seeing fibrosis. We'll learn a little bit about fibrosis on the next slides. But basically in proliferative stage, we're rebuilding, the body's rebuilding. It's, it's the new tissue is gonna make up of collagen and extracellular matrix and um, the body is healing itself after the surgery. And this is the same stage of healing you'll have if you have a cut or if you have um, you know, reconstructive surgery, orthopedic surgery, all the stages of wound healing are the same for all kind of you know, insults to the body. And then finally, we had the maturation stage. Um, that's where you'll see that the scar massage will really help like two, three years, five years afterwards. Um, and then maturation stage, it's the collagen. Collagen is remodeled from type three to type one. And then it's aligned and water is reabsorbed. So that's where you can see sometimes that the scar um, is uh, re it's looking different. Your body is changing, even though it's been a few months after your surgery. This is the maturation stage where finally the, all the water is reabsorbed and your body returns to you know, its new baseline of homeostasis. So what I see for plastic surgery, um, the chemostasis should, should be within an hour or a few days. I wait until um, four days to start the massage. So I make sure everything's closed. Um, inflammatory can last up to you, like from the, uh, when the surgery happens to like three or four weeks, then at like three weeks, you start getting in the proliferative stage. Um, and that lasts from three weeks to, to uh, you know, at least a few months. It depends on how much surgery was done. And then the maturation stage is the very last stage. It can last up to the two years after um, the surgery itself, this very slow uh, remodeling of the body to make that scar thinner, um, lighter, less kind of chunkiness underneath it, flatter. Um, that's during the maturation stage. So let's uh, bust some myths according uh, about MLD. Um, so what is manual lymphatic drainage? What is not manual lymphatic drainage? The great resource that we have is uh, Gunter Close's Close uh, YouTube page. So if you look on the YouTube page, there's a video called Effective CDT, The Inconvenient Truth. And you uh, can forward through, if you can get this link and cut and paste it, or you can find the video itself and forward to the point where he's talking about MLD, you'll see some effective actual MLD that he's showing you in the video, the actual strokes. And then you'll see some other videos that he's found on the internet that say they're lymphatic massage, but they are not actually doing the job of stretching the skin that we know is what makes MLD so effective. So that's a really great video for you um, as a practitioner to make sure that you're doing the most effective strokes for this type of massage that you can. Um, very important, especially if you're getting clients from um, Miami, if you're getting clients from um, out of the country who have had liposuction, incisional drainage is not MLD. They might ask for lymphatic drainage because they think the dr lymphatic drainage means you're draining fluid from the incisions. It's not. Um, it's not MLD. And I talk a lot in my um, 
intake class about how to avoid misunderstandings with this. Definitely um, in the state of California, in the state of Florida, in several states around the nation, if not nationwide, it is um, out of our scope of practice as a massage therapist to push fluid out of incisions. And it's definitely out of our scope of practice to reopen in an incision and then push fluid out of incisions. Whether it has like a little drain plug, uh, uh, you know, or not, or you're using a syringe or not. All of this is uh, clearly in several states and you need to consult with your own um, state uh, about your scope of practice as a massage therapist. Usually this wound care is not a part of our um, scope of practice. And we need to make sure that the clients, potential clients know that. So we don't have the situation where we book somebody and then we've set the time aside for them. And then they come in and expect something that we're not going to be able to give them because it's out of our scope of practice. And then they leave unhappy and we don't have the money um, for that time that we booked for them. So I would urge everyone to be clear about the services you offer and do not offer, especially if you have had lymphatic drainage training for a while and you've done perhaps lymphedema clients, um, health and wellness clients, and you're thinking of starting to take liposuction clients. Some clients may ask for terms like squeeze therapy, drainage massage for you to reopen their incisions, push fluid or push fluid out of their drains. And all of these, you need to um, know your scope of practice as a massage therapist, know it in advance if you offer this or you do not, and then um, be able to communicate clearly to the potential client so there's no misunderstandings. So um, what is MLD good for? And then the, another thing that I'm hearing um, interestingly is that like MLD wouldn't necessarily be what these people need, um, what the clients need after plastic surgery. And the leaders in the industry would respectfully disagree with you. So uh, Dr. Hoyos is an amazing plastic surgeon. He's literally re re wrote the book on this. His book is High Definition Body Sculpting Art and Advanced Lipoplasty Techniques. This is um, a book, 20. 14, Hoyos and Prendergast, um, who's a plastic surgeon from Ireland, co-authored it. And he puts forth the CARE, Cosmetic Active Recovery System of Postoperative Care. So this is in the book. I would highly recommend if you want to do a deep dive on this, you can find his book. I definitely have my own copy in my office. He recommends MLD and he shows pictures that it is Vodder style manual lymphatic drainage starting two to three days after surgery, every two to three days for the first two weeks and as required thereafter. And the duration of lymphatic drainage session should be approximately 45 minutes. So this is the strongest, um, most convincing piece of text that I have that I would bring to a surgeon who would be wondering if your Vodder style MLD would be appropriate for their clients, especially if that surgeon is doing high definition body sculpting type of liposuction. But though MLD is effective, just MLD is not enough. Um, and I shared my story before of the client that didn't rebook because she had fibrosis and I didn't know how to treat it. So my question to everyone before you start to really um, open up and take clients is, do you know how enough to massage lumps, bumps, and fibrosis? So not just MLD. And you can't just do MLD more and more and more and expect someone's fibrosis to completely resolve. If you cannot meet a client's needs, they will not rebook. Um, that's which I've seen it in my practice. I've seen it in other people's practices. And it's something you need to know if you want to operate a successful business. So here's another study um, where in this study will show us about fibrosis, specifically fibrosis um, after plastic surgery. So this is um, a study on manual lymphatic drainage and it's, um, it's physiotherapists. So they also use therapeutic ultrasound, which is not the same as ultrasound cavitation. They use therapeutic ultrasound in liposuction and lipoabdominoplasty. So they had a tummy tuck and some lipo. Um, at the same time. And these authors state swelling and bruises should be reduced as early as possible. Um, and you should start in the early postoperative period to prevent fibrosis. 
Fibrosis is the formation of hardened plates of subcutaneous tissue. And uh, they may give temporary or definitive irregularities on the surface of the skin. The fibrosis may um, stop the skin from laying down smoothly. It, will, it may affect the body's contour. Um, from an aesthetic point of view, fibrosis is considered one of the most frequent complications. They may interfere negatively and significantly affect um, patient satisfaction after surgery. So fibrosis is um, proteins in the, uh, in the interstitial fluid that are allowed to stay there and not taken up by the body's lymphatic system. And then they can eventually form these quote, hardened plates in the subcutaneous tissues. So what are, uh, what is one of the things that I use to help reduce fibrosis? Um, one of the things that I use is my massage cupping machine. Uh, I've taken the formal massage cupping training and then um, adapted it to help with fibrosis and to help with um, reducing swelling after surgery. Um, I also, I have a class uh, with Nick Timba credits on that topic. Um, but let's look at this great study, um, Got at All 2018, and they are explaining what we're doing when we're using negative compression on someone. And I want to call it negative pressure massage therapy versus cupping, because if we use cupping, people think I'm going to make a big red circle on them. And that would happen. I tell people in, in the office, like that would happen if I left this cup on you for three minutes, I'd absolutely pull some shaw up. Um, but I don't want to hear a call from your plastic surgeon about why I've uh, used traditional Chinese cupping on someone, you know, a week or two after plastic surgery. So I am going to leave the cup on you for one to two seconds and adjust the pressure and the way I move the cup around on your body, whether I'm uh, starting to reduce your swelling through negative pressure massage therapy or whether I'm trying to um, change the appearance of the fibrosis. Um, so this is the uh, this is the twenty dollar bill definition of uh, what happens with negative pressure. So if you wanted to learn more about, definitely the study is really great and my class is really great. Um, and the second quote is talking about how their theory um, that negative pressure uh, massage therapy may also address. Uh, inflammation, and it's the variety of interstitial pressures. It's the fact that I'm uh, reducing the pressure on inside the cup versus the regular pressure against, you know, gravity outside of the cup. That variation in interstitial pressure can encourage the lymphatic vessels um, to improve their flow and flow faster, which would um, help the lymphatic system more um, quickly evacuate the swelling out of the area. So we've talked a little bit about cupping and, and how I use it. Let's uh, focus on um, the, the idea that sessions are not one size fits all. Um, and this is something that I've learned as I've taken different types of um, clients in my office. It's like never a dull day where I am. And I'm the kind of person who always likes a lot, something new every day, something to, to help people and to really have them see the benefit of the massage. Today, I started off with a Lipo 360 Brazilian butt lift client that had her operation last week. Then my second client was given to me, um, referred to me. She had a liposuction to the abdomen, fat transfer to the breast. Um, and then she had um, massive weight loss and a bunch of surgeries before that, a bunch of plastic surgeries, but that same doctor will also refer liposuction to the abdomen, fat transfer to the breast um, for people with breast cancer reconstruction. And then my third client was, uh, she had lipedema. She, so she had some liposuction because she had the disease lipedema um, and she had liposuction to reduce the fat in her arms. Um, and this is after she had some surgery to reduce the fat in her legs. So it's always a new, um, adventure every day and a mix that will keep me interested and kind of on my toes. Uh, I wanted to share with you really quick some uh, techniques and bolstering for different operations and I go more deeply into this in each of the classes on the different surgeries. So for the facelift, um, I used to do two pillows and now I do a wedge underneath 
um, their upper back and their head and a uh, pillow on top of that wedge because the name of the game in the facelift, um, especially since I've had one, is you have to um, elevate the head at all times and that helps with lymphatic drainage. Same thing with the tummy tuck, um, it's called the semi fowler position. So I'll have that I'll have the client up on that wedge with the pillow over the wedge and then I'll even put a wedge underneath um, their feet and their legs. Uh, for the Brazilian butt lift, I have a complex, um, I really have something that works really well where I use a rolled up yoga mat, I use a pillow, I use a bolster, and I use two other pillows under their knees in order to get the clients to be able to lie on their back um, to receive the massage of a lot of other therapists will have them stand up. And I find this is always a problem potentially with um, our uh, the laws, especially in the state of California, very clear about how you should have clients covered and you should cover their anatomically sensitive areas at all time. And this is uh, using this type of bolstering allows me to have them recline on their back. They're very comfortable. And then they can turn over and uh, you know just lie down normally on the table and they're covered by the, uh, we're covered by sheets at all time. And I can uh, um, expose just the areas that I'm working on. For the body lift and brachioplasty and thigh lift, that's when you use some different techniques because this is um, sometimes not only the liposuction, but there's, there's also been an incision. So you have to be very sensitive um, around the incisions and not move the skin too much while the skin is still healing up. Um, so that would be similar to the treatment that I would do near an incision near a tummy tuck. Um, and then liposuction one liter versus liposuction five liters. I'm gonna see the liposuction of five liters a lot more than I'm gonna see the liposuction of one liter. The liposuction of five liters is more often going to um, have potential problems with their compression garment fitting correctly, with them having foams in it, uh, with me using um, different techniques to reduce their fibrosis. Whereas if someone only has one liter of liposuction for a fat transfer, you know, less than one liter fat transfer to the face, fast transfer to the breasts, um, that's going to be less appointments for me, more MLD, and just making sure that they're healing nicely um, and not really needing to spend too much of their money or time on extensive um, sessions. So this is one thing that I'm frustrated with and I've heard clients be frustrated with. I cannot, before I see you and look at you and know what operation you had, I can't sell you a 10 session package because if you have two, one liter of liposuction, I might only need to see you one or two times. So it's not one size fits all. And then liposuction for lipedema, the client is in my office many more sessions than they would be with cosmetic liposuction because of the way that they do the liposuction for lipedema. They're taking out a lot more of the fat and it's not for a cosmetic reason. So that's somewhere I will um, use vibration. I will use negative compression. I will use um, IASTM techniques because I see more fibrosis in that client than in a cosmetic client. And then I get, we talked briefly before, liposuction for breast reconstruction. This is actually something that I really love, which is I am, I started off as an oncology massage therapist and then I got MLD and then I went to the CLT training because I wanted to be able to help people with a cancer history who are in active cancer treatment and um, as they're going to breast reconstruction to be able to have a surgeon that specializes in breast reconstruction feel confident enough to personally hand people my card and say, Kathleen is gonna do a great job for you. And to know um, and to trust me to handle their clients. Um, this is like the core and the most beautiful client um, experience that I have to be able to help someone after cancer. Um, all the operations, all the treatment, they're already into the reconstruction. And then this is, I like to talk about it like this may be the first appointment that they have that's an hour that no one is like poking them or like measuring them. It's just a relaxing time for them to be able to um, do something nourishing for their body as they're in the survivorship. So that is um, 
kind of why I do what I do for the cosmetic clients is so I have the talent in my hands to help the clients um, who have a cancer history. So we're in the home stretch and I want to just um, blast another uh, big, um, big misconception and that is the image versus reality in plastic surgery. Um, the image of what we think the plastic surgery client is, why we think they're there, what they think they want as a result. We cannot just assume um, and I had this great picture on the left is like what society would tell you someone looks like after a facelift and a rhinoplasty. That's why she has that thing on her after a rhinoplasty. And I also had a facelift, a neck lift, a rhinoplasty. And this is what I looked at one week afterwards, actually, when my, um, when my, uh, that the splint on my nose was actually removed. This is how I looked. So the client that comes in looks different than the client we think is going to come in. So you really have to take your time and be in the moment and meet the client where they are and ask them what their goals are for the surgery and what they want to do and make sure that we're treating the whole person not just the area of surgery that they had and see what their goals are. Um, and that goes, uh, dovetails really great into my next couple of slides, which are about clinician presence. So this is what I'm really passionate about um, in my intake class. And I'm really trying to study that more deeply in this year in 2022 the focus on clinician presence, how it's not just, I put the skills in my hands, I have the tools in my office, but I want to work on um, the heart of the massage therapist and how we meet them um, as people in the office um, and our, our relationship from person to person. Um, so this is what I, I want to um, focus on. Our clients are in a period of transition when they see us. Um, they recently underwent a voluntary surgery. So that's, it's, the experience is a little bit different because I've had reconstructive surgery on my face. Um, I've had cancer surgery on my face and now I had plastic surgery on my face. And the experience of the person that you would meet in me, the client after plastic surgery is different. Um, I'm, I'm, I come with a sense of guilt and regret at my first appointment where I'm not quite sure why I did this to myself. And as a therapist, we have to understand that's totally normal. This buyer's regret after plastic surgery is completely normal and it happens to almost all of us. Um, so we're dealing with the effects both physically and emotionally. And as a therapist, we have the opportunity to hear them. So we're not a, we're not a, uh, we're not a mental health therapist. We're not guiding them. We're not talking to them. Um, we're hearing them, and maybe that's our power, is that we're, we have this presence that they can give trust to us and tell us their stories and share their fears with us as they answer the intake questions that we ask. And then I just like to have you um, for a moment and maybe more deeply later, um, if you're a journal type person, I would, you, this would definitely be interesting to journal about, about what have your experiences been um, as a person in your past with clinician presence, when you meet a doctor, when you meet a nurse, um, have you had a negative experience with a distracted doctor? It's that famous statistic that it takes only seven seconds. It takes only 15 seconds for your doctor to interrupt you at the beginning of your appointment. Um, and how does that make you feel? Do you feel heard when you know, we're only giving a very short intake and, and we don't really need to see details about them and have them kind of share with us. You know, we just need them to take most of their clothes off and lie under, you know, lie beneath the table and we'll just take care of everything. And have you had a positive experience with a doctor with amazing clinician presence? So that's what I really have in my doctor, Dr. Seidel. Um, she's my primary care physician and also in my plastic surgeon. It's someone I really chose to, uh, to have a plastic surgeon that I had that trust bond with. And I know that at my surgery center, they are going to listen to me. 
So uh, one last study to look at back at all uh, back in 2009, talking about compassionate silence in the patient clinician encounter. And this is a type of silence that we can use as the client is telling us their story as the client is processing um, you know, the recovery of their surgery during the massage, after the massage, and during their intake when they take a pause and when they're telling us their story. It's the type of silence that reflects the quality of mind that we contribute to this encounter. It affirms our relatedness and understanding. And if you've ever seen in silence when two people are able to be comfortable in silence together, mutual wisdom can ar arise. The client can come to some wisdom and we can come to some wisdom. So compassionate silence will arise from um, us spontaneously when we have the mental capacity of stable attention. So we're paying attention in the moment. We're able to be in the moment with the client. We have emotional balance. Uh, we're not hyper aroused or disassociated hypo aroused. So we're not in this burnout. Um, and we have these pro-social mental qualities. So we're bringing empathy and compassion to our intake, to our massage, to help with our clients when we're at work. So these are my key takeaways. Um, uh, I would uh, encourage you to complete adequate training before booking clients. We'll need experience in MLD and in fibrosis techniques. We've heard this both from the client perspective and from your fellow therapist perspective. I would encourage you to customize your sessions based on their pain tolerance, their stage of wound healing and the type of surgery they had. And this is in addition to the ways we learned in massage school to customize our sessions. How fast is our stroke? How many strokes are we doing a minute? How deep is our stroke? How intense is the whole massage? And just understand that we can make our strokes slower. We can do less. We can be less intense if the client feels like um, the intensity is too much at our, at our usual rate of giving a massage. I am um, always telling clients, please tell me if it hurts too much because I can still get the same results without hurting you. I don't need to go fast and hard and strong to get the results, sometimes going gentler. And I'm a, a student of Ipsby and I know one of my teachers is on here. So they have absolutely taught me like going slower is sometimes a way to get in deeper. Um, and then finally, recognize the role of clinician presence and compassionate silence in improving the qualities of your sessions. And I talked about that in my intake class and I'm going to be focused on that more in 22, 2022. So definitely uh, stay tuned for that. So here are my resources and everyone will get um, a copy of a PDF of this slide. So you can see all the slides um, in the follow-up email, but this is how you can get in contact with me if you want to. I'm on Instagram and Twitter um, at Kathleen Listen. I'm on TikTok at Kathleen Listen. I also have a LinkedIn account. Um, I definitely look at messages there. And then my uh, CE classes, which are uh, Nick Timba, I'm a Nick Timba approved provider are at plastic surgery recovery massage.teachable.com. And that's if you follow me on my Instagram and look at my link in bio or my TikTok, you'll be able to uh, find the link to those classes as well. Thank you so much. Well, hi. I'm hi. coming back, I think. Yes. But um, there have been some chats. Great that I'd like to um, read to you and we can just take it from there. Perfect. Um, everyone feel free to still continue to ask Kathleen questions via chat. And um, let's see where to begin. Uh, can we get um, from Jody? can we get where the this research findings are from. Yes. So yeah. when you get the PDF tomorrow, you'll get the slide right before this one what has the um, URLs of everything. And then that goes to the full, the full research of it all. Yep. And Xavier, what do you tell your clients to prepare for MLD post-op? Do they continue their pain medication as scheduled 
or wait until after the massage? I love that. At first, I thought I was going to tell you that MLD is not that painful, that they don't need to take. So they don't need to take a pain pill before. That's something I've had less often as I take um, only referrals from plastic surgeons and they're told at the plastic surgery office that they don't have to take pain medication. I actually have Narcan at my office because I'm so scared that someone's potentially going to take an extra opioid because they think the massage is going to be so painful. Um, what I would say is if you're scheduled to take it, take the pain medication after the massage. Um, if you think that it's going to run too fast through your lymphatic system. Frankly, um, I'll take, I'll take uh, uh, liposuction cases starting at four or five days. People are usually just on extra strength Tylenol at that point. And then I'll take tummy tucks after the drains are removed. I really have not seen that many people that are on um, serious pain medications like an opioid or a gabapentin. Usually a lot of people are really focused on getting off of the serious pain medications as soon as possible. And they're just on extra strength Tylenol. Thank you. And Jody is asking, um, so would you wait to offer MLD if they still have a drain, which you just answered, if the yeah. surgeon wants you to start at day three and move fluid to the drain? I, I would not do that. I would not do that. I would, um, I, because I've heard surgeons say that they don't like that because the MLD, you're moving around the drain inside the body potentially. I think MLD, if you do it correctly, it's in a different segment of the tissues. Um, I don't know if Andrea Brennan is uh, able to type in the chat, if this is Dr. Andrea Brennan that I know, um, that her opinion on this, um, but I usually don't, I've never had a surgeon ask me to, to direct fluid to the drains because the drain usually, it has a long tube in it. So you can't just push fluid right to where the drain's coming out because the drain itself is uh, pushing fluid in. I, you, most of my surgeons, they put the compression on, let the drain do its job itself. The more movement I have, the more when there are drains in and, and when it's at, the more movement I do like massage on someone that still has drains in, I'm scared of giving them a seroma. Um, whether I physically could or not, I don't want someone to call and say two days after my massage, they developed a seroma and now it has to get um, drained with a syringe. I'd rather just have them get the drains out, put the proper amount of compression on, get their drains out and then come and see me. And Amanda is sharing, uh, we use pregnancy pillow with the hole to bolster the hips and glutes region, which allows the fat grafts to be not impacted when supine for Brazilian butt lift. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I'm just, as long as we can get it. So there, I, I have a surgeon in San Diego um, that does a really great job with hip dips. Um, and so we want those hip dips to not have any, um, any pressure on them at all. And um, Jenny is asking, are you also AMTA certified for CEUs? Yes, AMTA I believe takes Nick Timba CEUs. Okay, and that's something to check with your state AMTA. chapter? Okay. Yeah, I, I would really, think that AMTA takes Nick Timby CPUs. Yeah. Okay. I have found that a boopy pillow works really well with positioning a patient with a Brazilian butt lift. So I, it's up to each individual therapist. I don't use the boppy pillow. Um, that's a breastfeeding pillow and a lot of them will sit on it. Um, I try to have, I, I, the, the system that I use, I really like, and the, the clients seem to like it as well, but there's plenty of different options out there for people to try. All right. Um, Jody is asking, do you worry with measurements at any time? I originally I was going to, um, but I don't, what I like to see clients experience is that they can get into a tighter link on their FAHA. So when okay. that garment goes down, they can see that they're getting smaller. 
Oh, well, I'm going to slip in a question here. During the massage, are they wearing their compression garments or? No. Okay. Nope. I if they're fa I usually say if you're fancy, if you bring underwear, you could wear underwear. Um, they can definitely wear a bra if they've had a fat transfer or even if they just feel like they want to wear a bra. But clients are in their bra and underwear um, if they want to or they're completely naked and I cover them with a sheet and their, their anatomical areas are covered at all times. But you can't, the massage is a skin stretching massage, so I need to have access to the skin. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Sharon, what type of training would you suggest for nurse practitioners who are taking care of post-op patients? I would say um, go to your nursing board and see if you have CEUs um, with the nursing. Um, you can definitely take my classes, but it won't be approved for your nursing CEU. So I'd love you to be able to earn nursing CEUs at the same time. Um, absolutely. Um, many people saying thank you. And um, a question here from Jody: How long should you wait between sessions? Um, it depends. I usually have like Hoyos and Prendergast said twice a week. Um, if I see a lot of swelling, I'll do twice a week for maybe the first two weeks. And, uh, uh, but I don't do every day. Um, I usually do twice a week and let the compression garment and the foams do a lot of the work. Okay. And Eva, any suggestions about breathing recommendations while they are recovering? I want to encourage diaphragmatic breathing, yep. but they are under so much compression in the is fascia. I don't, I don't know that word. Uh, okay. Yeah, Spanish. It's a Spanish word. So, and that's something I really want to talk about with the clients, because if you're under so much compression that you can't take a proper diaphragmatic breath, you need to think about reducing the compression. That's no longer the optimal level of compression for you. You can actually start getting acid reflux. You can get swelling in the feet. Um, so I want it to be the optimal amount of compression for them. Um, if you take in the MLD class, when we start with the abdomen sequence, we do some deep breathing. Um, we train, you know, we ask for the deep breathing. And at that point, I will tell people diaphragmatic breathing is really good for you throughout your uh, healing. And I also talk about that at, in the plastic surgery recovery handbook. Great. And another question from Jody: Is it okay to book clients once per week till swelling is gone? Yeah, if you like it and they like it, absolutely. Uh -huh. They have to um, like it. Yeah. Okay. I love your comment. There's some um, other other thank yous and um, people interested in contacting you. Yep. Um, right to on learn more screen. and Definitely. share with what how they've been trained. Right. Um, let's see, will I be able to watch the presentation? I missed it as it was running. Okay, yes, um, this will be recorded. Uh, this is recorded. Yep. And it will be sent out with um, the recording and the PowerPoint presentation will be sent in follow-up tomorrow. Um, right. Once the recording has posted to YouTube and uh, biotone.com under the Edu Talks tab. Um, let's see what else we have here. Did you request, do you request them to provide doctor referral to have on file? So as when COVID started, I started that because that was the rule in the state of California. And I found it so effective for improving my practice that I require that from all my clients. It helps me to, I'm just one person. So it helps me to keep my schedule open enough to have all the doctors refer to me to be able to get their clients in. So you don't have to, but I definitely do. Right, and there is a question um, are you able to share the name of the San Diego hip dip doctor? <laughs> yes, if you, you answer the, find me on Instagram and I'll send you their Instagram and then you can look at their, their before and afters. Okay. And do you read, oops, that one. Let's see. 
Sorry, uh, my apologies. It just skipped. Um, do you recommend a site for Faha purchases? I just did an Instagram post on this. It depends. It needs to be the Faha that fits you correctly. Um, you will get a compression garment from your doctor. You'll wake up from one. You'll be given one before you leave. Um, if the, your doctor wants you in compression and then they, the doctor usually guides you after that. Um, and we'll see. So what I do is I see if the compression is working correctly for you and then we can make changes at that point. Okay. And do you use any oil for your massages? Yep. When I do the fibrosis massage, I use jojoba oil. Okay. Can you touch on compression and how strongly or not you feel about encouraging clients to wear foams and boards? I do all the time. I would uh, watch my Instagram and you'll see me share a mouthful about that. And someone did share a website, um, com. So there's a lot. Yeah, there's a What's lot that? of brands of Fajas out there. Okay. And that brings us to the end of the chats. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Thank you, everybody, so much. All right. I would um, just like to thank you and thank everyone for attending. Keep your eye on your in-basket for tomorrow with a follow-up email. Also, um, please join us again. I know there are a lot of new people that have um, joined EduTalks today. And we have a great lineup, uh, not only for February, but through the end of the year. And February 8th, we have Kelly Lene, and she will be um, doing her edu talk on flourishing, both personally and professionally. February 22nd, with Laura Clayton, Laura Allen Clayton, business and marketing strategies in the post-COVID world. And March, we have a great lineup as well. So thank you for joining us tonight. Kathleen, anything in wrapping up for you? Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you all in the future and talk to me on Instagram. I'd love to um, continue to grow this community with all of you. Thank you so much for your passion for massage. Well, so informative and um, a lot of thank yous have come in through chats and um, we look forward to learning more about your mindfulness um, book and class that will be coming out later this year, I believe. Thank you. Yes. Stay tuned. Thanks so much. Uh, all right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Join us again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.